Welcome, and good afternoon, almost. It's still good morning. We have three minutes left, and what a beautiful morning it's been. Okay, we are here to learn about what? Herbs. Herbs. Okay, very good. So we all are in the right place. That's important. And to begin um, our talk about herbs, I believe that everything that we study um, in health and nature and everything should point us back to whom? To God. And so let's look at the very first mentioning of herbs in the Bible. Where or in everywhere? Where is it? Genesis chapter 1. And one of the things that I love about herbs is this, in the story of creation. Now, my family grew up reading Genesis chapter 1 every Friday night to look at how the world began. And so we had to learn, just because of that repetition, we learned the days of creation. But it wasn't until I started to study herbs that something stood out to me very distinctly. Does anybody know what day the herbs of the field were made, that God created the grass and the herbs of the field? Well, Josiah's in the audience. Does he know? He's my brother? No. The herbs were f created on day three. Let's read it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 says, And God said, Let the herbs bring forth grass, the, the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And you'll see in the next couple of verses that the evening and the morning were which day? The third day. And the next, so that's, that's wonderful, right? But what makes that so interesting is that which day was the sun and the moon and the stars created? The fourth day. That's something we know pretty well. And just, I pause here to bring our attention to this point only because in pagan societies, in all of the world around us, um, and in evolution and all of these things that start out with the Big Bang Theory, they start with what? In the sun. They think that is the source and center of life, and they worship the sun for that. Uh, but we see in the very inception of Earth's creation that actually the thing that sustains our food, our source of life, the things that we eat, were actually in existence before the sun was ever created. And so that goes to show that the energy, the source of power behind the things that give us food, is really only God. And so the study of herbs at its core should always turn us back to fearing God and giving glory to Him. So I hope that this uh, now less than an hour will be doing just that. So let's begin with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to guide. Heavenly Father, we praise you for you have given us everything that we need. We can truly say that we have lacked nothing. Thank you so much that you have helped us to realize that this week. And Father, we are asking you to continue to open to our uh, minds and understandings your greatness and how you have provided through specifically the things of nature, the herbs of the field. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer and answering it in accordance to your will and your way. Uh, and Father, I just especially ask that you will give me clarity, clarity in my speaking and that I will um, be able to cover those things which are most important to you for your people today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. My name is Lydia LeJewel, and I'm from Maine. And I've been here for about five, four going on five years, four and a half years. And right before I came, I had the privilege of studying with an herbalist in Maine and for seven months. And after that, we call ourselves baby herbalists. And baby is the right term for it, for I am still just a newborn and learning. But I love to share what I'm learning because it helps me to learn more. And so that is my first encouragement to you, is as you learn, share. Everything that you are learning here, share it with those who you go back with. So we're going to look at some very basics of herbology so that we can have a good foundation and go forward in our studyings together. So we looked at the very basics, where it comes from. And this is the verse that tells us that the sun was made on the fourth day. 
as we carry forward, we see that God said, Behold, I have given you how many? Every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And we see that God then, after sin came, um, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So God created everything in the, in the garden. We know specifically the trees and the fruits and then the vegetables afterwards, which is interesting. As we are sick, it's those leafy greens that are so nutritious and so helpful for restoring health. Um, and I like this verse in Psalms 104.14 that says, He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and the herb for what? The service of man. It's there for our service, to serve us, to help us, um, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Okay, so we're going to quickly look at a definition. What is an herb? An herb is any plant with leaves, seeds, or flowers used for the flavoring, food, medicines, or perfume. Bundles of dried herbs. Um, you could be in an herb garden. Um, you could use it for cooking. And you can season with herbs. In botany, it, the definition includes any seed-bearing plant that does not have a woody stem and dies down to the ground after flowering. So that's the very specific definition, something that dies down, a non-woody herb. Um, but a wider definition includes an herb, a non-woody plant that dies down at, to the ground after flowering, but that term herb is often applied more generally to any plant part or any um, or all of which has been used for such purposes as medicinal treatments, nutritional value, food seasonings, or coloring, or dyeing, or other substances. So it's plants. Plants are herbs. Okay. Now what is the place of herbs in rational therapy? This is God's method. We read this um, from the, uh, yes. Let's just carry on. This is God's method, the herbs that grow for the benefit of man, and the little handful of herbs kept and steeped and used for sudden ailments have served tenfold, yes, 100-fold better purposes than all the drugs hidden under mysterious names and dealt out to the sick. So the servant of the Lord said that herbs can be, have been even more beneficial in the use of treating sicknesses than the conventional drugs. So let us get some exposure to these. Um, this quote simply says that God's miracles are not always with just a touch, but a miracle is through using the things that he has provided, including herbs, as we use those. The Lord can direct the mind to some simple remedy, and that is included in a miracle. Okay, we have just two more quotes, so you hold on with me. The use of certain herbs that the Lord has made to grow for the good of man is in harmony with what? The exercise of faith. So we can use these herbs along with faith to just work these miracles. And our last quote says that the Lord has provided antidotes for disease in simple plants. These are, we're going to look at these antidotes next. Um, that we can use these by faith, with no denial of faith, but by using the blessings provided by God for our benefit, we are what? Cooperating with Him. We can use water and sunshine and the herbs which He has caused to grow for the healing maladies brought on by what? Indiscretion or accident. So I see in this mercy. God has provided through the herbs mercy because a lot of times we bring the sicknesses on ourselves that we have, indiscretion or an accident. And, but God has provided for our needs even here. So these antidotes, we're going to look at a list of them. We're not going to delve into it too deeply just now, but I want to give you an exposure to all of the actions that herbs include. Now, you can see there's 
Maybe you recognize some of these words, adaptogen, alternative, um, antifungal, antiseptic, antidiarrheal, anti-infective, anthelmintic, antacid, um, more include bactericidal, astringent, aromatic, um, antitoxin, cathartic, qualagog, fungicide, laxative. Me these may be very familiar words or very strange words to you, but these include actions, the properties that herbs have in them um, to be able to have a reaction on the body. And I want to read to you something that uh, a well-respected herbalist shared. Uh, this is uh, Jim McDonald, and he said this. I don't think it could possibly be overstated how important it is to understand the properties by which herbs work. This knowledge is what separates a mediocre herbalist from someone who memorizes the name of a problem and the name of an herb that is listed next to it and says it's used for that or it's good for this. Um, but a good herbalist is someone who says, oh, dry inflamed tissue, which mucilaginous herbs should I use for this? A mucilaginous herbs is something that would bring like mucus, if you, to be very simple, to that area. If you have dried tissue, you want to bring some moisture to that. So understanding these properties opens up a new world of possibility to the herbal student. It allows one to more deeply understand the herbs they are using and see patterns in both plants and people more clearly. It also clears up the head scratching that occurs when you're reading an herbal book and you have no idea what they're referring to when they say anti -cataral. While you could go through this list and try to memorize terms and definitions, the best way to gain an understanding of the material is to do so experimentally. You can read what an astringent is or you can chew on a green banana peel and experience it or something like wild geranium root. This you will understand from experience. Or you can understand that mucilaginous is, or mucilage is a viscid, viscid, slippery carbohydrate, but making a strong infusion of marshmallow root or slippery elm and playing around with the resulting goo will allow you to not only understand with your head, but also with your body as well. And who would want to pass up the opportunity to compare and contrast the varying degrees of bitter? So learn this stuff. Years later, you'll either be glad you did or wish you had. So it's all about getting your hands dirty and experiencing it. And on, the, on your schedule, this is called an herb talk. And we only have a short amount of time. But I want to allow you at least a little bit of giving you some practical hands-on of how you can bring it back home and have some fun experimenting with it. Okay? So we're going to carry on. Um, we're going to skip through a little bit because time is ahead of us. So, but you have this in, if you look in your handouts, you have these as well. Um, and we are just encouraged to learn how to treat ourselves, to study these things out for yourselves. So I hope that you're Experience with herbs does not end here, but continues. So we're going to look at some terms and preparations to get you started when you pick up your next herb book. The first one is infusion. When I started getting interested in herbs, there were all these weird words that I said, what does that mean? And so I just wanted to jump to the chase and let you know. Infusion. An infusion is the process of extracting chemical compounds or flavors from plant material with a solvent such as water, oil, alcohol, by allowing the material to remain suspended in the solvent over time, a process often called, what? Steeping. Okay, an infusion is also the name for the resulting liquid. So give me an example of an infusion. Tea, amen. So infusion might be a big word, but tea is the simple word. And you can make teas of almost any herb that you see growing. Um, even gra open your herb uh, cabinet, your spice cabinet. You have oregano, you have basil in there. Try it, taste it, see what it tastes like, and experience those different things. And you will um, be an infusion is probably the simplest kind of herbal uh, creation to make. The next one is pretty simple as well. Is a decoction. Okay. And a decoction is a method of extracting by 
boiling or dissolving the chemicals from the herbal plant material, which may include uh, the stems, the roots, the barks, the rhizomes. Uh, and decoction involves first mashing and then boiling in water to extract the oils, the volatile organic compounds, and other chemical substances. A decoction can be used to make teas, coffees, tinctures, and other similar solutions. So basically, what's the difference between an infusion and a decoction? One's boiled. Very good. So you're just adding heat to it. An infusion, you don't have to heat it up. A decoction, you do it. So we're going to now pause in our um, looking at the definitions and make an infusion. How does that sound? Sounds pretty cool? Yes? Okay, so I've chosen um, to take some comfrey and some chickweed and the first thing in order to be able to make an infusion is to gather your herbs. And in a few slides, we are going to look at the properties and the um, different, uh, how to identify a little bit of the most common simple herbs that you can find around your house. And I chose them because I want you to be able to do things that are right around you and not have to go to the store and buy them. Because I think that most of the things that the Lord gives us, he provides right around us or, or in a way that's accessible to everyone, even those who may not have as much uh, money or things like that. So the first thing to make an infusion is to have some herb. Um, we're going to make an oil infusion. And so you need your herb, you need a jar, and you need some kind of liquid to extract the herbal properties in. Okay, so I've chosen olive oil. Um, one interesting thing with olive oil is that it's um, the purest olive oil that you can find you should get from Italy. And if you'll see on a jar, it might say, with oil from Italy. But you have to look at um, the back side, and it will maybe tell you also from Spain and from um, Portugal or different places. Now, why Italy? Because they have the best laws about no pesticides on their olive plants. So you have the, the purest oil that way. So generally, when you make an infusion, if you're doing it with fresh herbs, you don't have to let it dry or anything like that. And you actually, especially when you're doing it with oil, you don't want to let it, um, you don't want to wash it. Because what happens when oil and water go together? They, they don't mix very well, right? And you can actually make your oil go rancid if it has um, moisture in it. So you just want to make sure that your herb is growing in a clean place um, and you want to harvest it when it's um, nice and sunny, uh, not right when it's raining. So you take your fresh herb and you're going to pack your jar with it. I also have another one here that we're going to look at and this is chickweed. Yes, you can, you can wash it and dry it out um, if you're afraid of the place where you gathered it from or if you have pets and you think they might have done something around it. But generally, um, you know, this is, for an oil, you're only going to be using it topically. So that's a, a disclaimer I should throw out there. You're not going to be eating it, so it's just like, you know, it's going to be getting into your skin, into your body, but it's not the same as digesting it directly. So I'm also using chickweed, and we're going to look at the beneficial properties of that pretty soon. So um, you, wanna, you want to put them in fresh. The only reason, now you see this, does this look very fresh to you? No, it doesn't look very fresh. This is an example of something fresh. The reason why I chose to let my comfrey wilt is was because when I was um, in a class learning about how to make oils, um, one dear lady, she used fresh comfrey. And generally, we would use fresh plantain or fresh St. John's wort to make our infusions. But when she used fresh comfrey, it was too wet in and of itself. And so it, um, it actually had enough water as if it had like been washed or, or been rainy. And it made it go rancid. And it did not smell good at all. So. That is, we're going to learn from her mistake and let our comfrey wilt a little bit. We'll still have the beneficial properties. And so we're just going to pack our jar just as full as can be. Um, 
and I'm also gonna and it's and you can mash your herb a little bit before you're putting it in because that's gonna break the cell walls and allow the um, the medicine to come out and to be um, mixed in with the uh, oil. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can. With roots, um, you'd want to do some way of like chopping it up or, um, you know, mashing it up so that way it would be um, maybe even drying it and powderizing it or, or cutting it, then drying it and, and putting it in like a coffee grinder because that will um, make it more accessible. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're just filling our jar mashing it up. We're going to get a wooden spoon over here. Oh, we're on. Okay. And I hope I have enough olive oil, but for the sake of... Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So, we were just talking about how, you know, these things should be free to everyone, right? Well, if you, um, hmm? You can use water, right? Yeah, you can make an infusion. And what I would do with this, why we're making this, I'll add some more oil afterwards just for your, like, to let you know. Um, but you can make poultices with the fresh herbs. This is if you can't um, get the herb uh, in like right when, if you want to preserve the herb, that's what I'm trying to say, or if you want to make a salve out of it to take with you. But um, if you need the herb in the moment of an acute accident, you can make a poultice out of it fresh, and I believe Sister Valerie's gonna talk to you about poultices, uh, maybe this afternoon or so, so I save that for her. But a poultice is basically applying the fresh herb, or even the dried, and rehydrating it to the skin topically. So I'm just mixing it all in there, trying to get, um, make sure that the air bubbles float to the top. I will put more oil in, I should have had more, but to fill it up right up to the neck so there's just as little amount of air as possible in there. Then I'll cap it off, I will label it, and put the date on it so that way um, we make sure that we remember. Because how long are we gonna let our oil to sit for, or infusion? Well, with oils, you let it sit for about four weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a way of speeding the process up and doing it with heat, but you must be careful with that because you don't want to deep fry your herbs, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that the heat doesn't get hotter than 130, 120. Um, you want to keep it below that as you're and then you can do, you can make an infusion in just four hours. Okay, so that is a simple infusion. And we are going to, how much olive oil? You fill the jar. You fill the jar with your herb, and I can even put some more herb in there, I have more space. And then you fill the jar with your oil afterwards and make sure that there's no air bubbles, okay? Let us carry on. So that's our infusion. Mm, where did I put my clicker? Here we go. Now you can use other things to make infusions. You can use um, olive oil, we mentioned that, water, um, and even glycerols and tinctures. But this is our oil. Okay, so here we go. This is our steps of harvesting, um, cleaning, making sure it's dry if, if it needs to be, um, pouring the liquid over it, and taking out the air bubbles um, and make sure it's full. Okay, leaving a minimal amount of air space, capping the jar and storing it in a warm but dark place for two to three weeks. Now, there's just discrepancies. Wherever you go, you'll hear between two and four weeks. And I say the more the merrier, right? Um, but between two and four weeks, just depending on how soon you need it. And some will tell you to put it in a sunny window, and some will tell you to put it in a dark place. So that's something you need to experiment with too. And it's interesting, um, St. John's work, we won't look at it specifically, so I'll share it now. 
is one of the herbs that um, I associate it with. It's like an herb that has to do with the sun because internally, when you take St. John's wort, it will make your skin sensitive to the sun. Externally, it has the SPF of four, which protects your skin from the sun. And then, when you put the oil in the sun to infuse, it will actually turn a beautiful red color. And so, it's kind of one of those things that it's supposed to help. It's good for mood, for also depression, and that's um, something that often comes with a lack of sunlight, right? So it's pretty interesting to see, to, to gather these connections, and we can also look at the spiritual connections. And what does red remind us of? The blood, the blood of Christ, and that's the only thing that can truly heal us from any of our depression or things of that nature. So look for those, because it's all throughout nature. Okay, we, um, we then can use our, our oil to make salves, and we'll save this for the end if we still have time. But the things that you need for salve is your infused oil, and beeswax, and um, your herbs, of course. Salves are pretty simple to make, and so I want to equip you to be able to know how. The next thing we're going to look at is tinctures and extracts. And that's probably what a lot of people know of for herbs. They take tinctures of herbs, or take some kind of um, supplement. And it's pretty um, simple. A tincture is made similarly to how you would make an infusion. You put the herb into some kind of liquid and let it um, steep. But this will take a lot longer. Um, a tincture is generally made with um, something like uh, an alcohol to preserve it. If you make an, a tincture with just water, that will keep for probably about uh, a day or two in the refrigerator. But if you preserve it in something like alcohol, then it would keep a lot longer. Now, um, we know that alcohol is toxic to the liver and we seek to avoid it as much as possible. So there are many other methods, um, and one that is, the two that I like the best is cheese, that's fresh, but if you're seeking to preserve it, then you can use something like a glycerite, glycerol, uh, vegetable glycerin, and this also will help to preserve the herb for a prolonged period of time. And the things that you need for this as well is you simply take the, um, the glycerol, and you have your herb, and depending, you can use it with either fresh herbs or dried herbs. And we're gonna do, um, and we're gonna show you with some dried herbs. Let me see if I have another slide. No, okay. Um, so, you fill your jar halfway, or about three quarters away with the dried herb. This is how we make a glycerol. And then you're gonna get some boiling water, and my water is not boiling anymore, so we're gonna turn it back on. Okay, and while that boils, we'll talk about the process. Oh, it's coming. Okay, so you fill your jar halfway, or three quarters of the way full, and if you're doing it with a fresh herb, you would just fill the jar all the way, like we did for the um, oil. But if you're doing it with a dried herb, we're gonna fill it halfway, and then we're going to rehydrate it with the boiling water. And this is going to help to release and to draw out some of the properties, just like making a regular infusion. But then we're going to cover the rest of the way with glycerol to be able to be the preserving factor, and also it's going to help to extract the rest of the power out of the herbs as well, and um, keep it for up to like one to two years. So. That sounds like we're getting hot over there. Then this you would let sit also two to four weeks um, as well. Now the next thing is, if you say, I don't have two to four weeks, I need this quickly, I need an extract now, and sometimes we do, there is a method of making it that can help to draw out the powers more quickly with using a crock pot. And what you do is you do the same process of pouring the herbs over the, the liquid over, you put the first the hot water, then you fill it the rest of the way with the glycerol if you are using dried herbs, and then you'll put it into your crock pot on just the keep warm setting, not on the cook or the low, because we don't want to again cook our herbs, we just want to use the heat to draw out the herbs um, a little bit more quickly, because heat encourages that. Hmm? Yes, there's, there's water in the crock pot, and then even on the bottom of the crock pot, there's like a little face cloth or something just to cushion between the glass and the crock pot. 
and then daily you will shake it. Shaking it daily. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, you always want to shake it up because that will help to um, just stir it to keep getting the medicinal value out of it. So we're going to take this. No. So oil really won't preserve it if you do the oil? It will, yeah, oil will. Now after the four weeks you're going to drain your herb off and then you'll be left with something that looks like this, right? Just your oil. Mm-hmm. 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 So there might be something in garlic, but we were told that you could only keep it for like five days. Mm-hmm. So um, it's the garlic, maybe? Did you, no, did you drain off the, um, the oil, like the garlic out of it? Or did you no, keep the garlic in it? For a salad dressing, we just kept the garlic. Mm -hmm. So if you're keeping the plant in it, the plant can start to degrade and spoil. And so you, you might not want to eat that garlic after a few days of you know, it being in there because food goes bad. But if it's just the oil like this and you strained all the plant part out of it, there's nothing left in it hopefully to mold or mildew. So your oil's not going to go rancid unless, you know, you have it open or exposed or something. So we're going to pour our, our water in just to cover our plant matter and rehydrate it. And we are making today um, a tincture, a, a glycerol, that will help with um, high blood pressure. So in it we have ginkgo, um, bilberry, corn silk, dandelion leaf, oh, you know what? We're supposed to have dandelion leaf, and hawthorn berry. Now I wanted to do an experiment with you all. And this is the first time that I do it. But that's what we're supposed to do, right? Experiment. So you don't mind if I do, right? You won't be enjoying it anyway. So <laughs> we can experiment with someone else. Um, we're going to do part of it would be dried. We're going to do the rest of it with fresh. OK? It's going to be fun. So we have here some dandelion leaves. And dandelion leaves are known for being a very diuretic. Uh, that's to help. And on, when people have hypertension, uh, one of the big things that they are encouraged to have is pills that are that cause have a diuretic effect on the body. So if we were to use our fresh herb, do you remember were we going to fill the jar halfway or all the way? All the way. All the way. So I'm going to just pack this in there the rest of the way after I've put my water in covering the dried herb. Just going to pack it in. Did you just give us a list of the dry herbs you had in the jar? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's corn silk, which is also a diuretic. Bilberry helps with circulation. People use it a lot for their eyes. And um, bilberry, hawthorn berry, also good for the heart. Hawthorn berry. And Josiah. Will you go and get me another wooden spoon? There might be one over there, but I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Are those dandelion leaves young? Or? Yes, I just picked them fresh, and they are the young ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to. They have to be young? Not necessarily. If you're going to eat them, the whole entire plant of the, the dandelion is edible. And they're less bitter if they're young. And. Um, I know for some plants, there's more medicinal value in a young one um, because all of that energy, just like sprouts, you know, um, that's the same principle. With a sprout, there's a lot of a lot more um, nutritional value in them because the seed has all that energy to produce a big plant, and so you're catching it right at that small stage. And so the young plant, uh, the young leaves as well, before the, it's growing a big plant, all that energy is going into the leaves to then produce a plant. So thank you, Josiah. Well, would you use the root too? The mm-hmm, you can. The dandelion root is known very much to be good for the, um, its ability to help with the liver and the kidneys. Um, so it's not, not 
it's, it probably does have some properties as a diuretic, but it's the leaves that have more of a diuretic value. So that's why we're using the leaves today. So then we shake it up really good. And then we can put it into our crock pot with the hot, nice warm water, keep warm. And that will be ready in just four days after being in the crock pot. And you want to shake it daily, uh, very vigorously, and make sure that you have it just as full as you can. And you strain it after the three to four days in the crock pot. And same thing with our oil. After the four weeks in a dark or sunny window, you choose, you experiment. Do you find that all herbs can be used, you can use glycerin to, to get for all of them, or, or do you have to use alcohol for some things? That's a good question. Um, my teacher believed back when she, um, she, she agreed that being an alcoholic was bad, like that alcohol is bad, but she definitely used alcohol medicinally, and so she was okay with using alcohol. We and drops. Right, just drops. So, so she was fine, and she understood, it was her understanding that there are some herbs that are especially harder, that it, it's um, only, you can only get the medicinal value with uh, vodka and with those things. But there's still stories where I've heard with those same herbs that she said you could only get it with vodka, where people have used it just straight, the herb, only um, as a tea and chewing it or something like that as well. And they have received benefit. So whether or not you can only use it with um, the vodka, things like um, the one that I'm thinking of is milk thistle. That's one that they say you need 100 proof uh, vodka or even stronger, which is the pure, um, the pure, Everclear. yeah, ever clear, yeah, the straight alcohol, no water added, no half and half. Um, but as far as if I have somebody, because the milk thistle is specifically for the liver damage, and if I have somebody who has that, um, I would be interested to see what you can do, how you can extract it, chewing on the seeds and, and using it in teas and extracting it th those other ways fresh to see if you can draw it out in other ways. It'd but be if interesting. You want to use it year round, you can't always get it fresh. That's true. Wine. Well, you can, seeds you can store. They store a lot better than like the, the leaves and those sorts of things. So, I yeah. I know you can get milk this and glycerin now, so mm -hmm. you're fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I've seen it sold that way too, even though they say that you don't get the medicinal oh, value. The yeah, and that's true. They say it's stronger when it's in the vodka or in the alcohol or whatever it is. Um, but if you're interested to trying without it, I would encourage you to try. Yeah, if, you, if you're comfortable using it, then go, go for it. Do whatever. I think the idea is to use it, to learn, and to just keep asking questions and growing as you go. So we've made our glycerol, and we're going to carry on and look quickly. How much time do we have? The time is flying. We're going to look at, this is a simple um, liniment, and liniments, as far as we're looking at definitions, remember, liniments is, are things that are used externally, and this is often with rubbing alcohol, or it can even be a mixture of an oil and a uh, tincture together. So it can be a water base and an oil base mixed together to make a liniment, something you would rub on the skin. So you'll see this includes some oils, peppermint and wintergreen oil. Are all your recipes in here? No. Some of them. Not all. Mm -hmm. um, I've, because I keep adding, you know how that goes, right? <laughs> okay, so here is the liniment. And you know, um, we can turn back if you don't catch something. If you want to stay afterwards, then we'll go back and allow you to like copy down, okay? So that way we'll save time and be able to hit some more of our things. Okay, and this is another example of a uh, liniment, um, and they're often used for like sprains, strains, just any kind of muscular pain, soreness, um, as um, the, it brings the herb quickly to the source of the pain. Okay, and this includes echinacea, an ounce of golden seal, an ounce of myrrh, two ounces of myrrh, and a half an ounce of cayenne pepper. And I think Sister Valerie shared with you about cayenne pepper a bit. I know she's. 
She's doing that today in the kitchen cabinet remedies. Um, so that, that's a wonderful, uh, good to help the circulation, help with pain, and other things as well. Okay, another um, in this definition section is powders. And we use powders a lot to, um, to take herbs in capsules. If you uh, have a hard time drinking teas, then there you can buy a capsule maker and you can grind your herbs or buy them in powders. The reason that I personally don't really prefer powders or, or capsules is because you then your body has to digest them and it takes longer for the medicinal value to get into your bloodstream as opposed to a tea or a glycerol where the power, the herbal properties have already been extracted from the herb. So I try not to use them, like, to, to make them my main source, but they still do have the herbal power properties in them, of course. And they can also be damaged by light a lot more. Um, they're more sensitive to light and to heat because you're breaking it down. So if you're seeking to store an herb, um, the best way to store it is as close to the original state as possible, like if you dry it, to keep the leaves whole and then break them down when you're ready to use them um, when it's dried. So we're going to look quickly at essential oils now. There are whole, you know, companies and books written on just essential oils. But the essential oils, they're, they're a lot of fun because they are the concentrated hydrophobic liquids containing volatile aromas and compounds from the plants. And this is where a lot of the, um, the energy, the power of the medicine is found in those essential oil parts of the plant. Um, so they, because they're so concentrated, you only use minute, tiny little bits to, um, to treat. The essential oils are generally extracted by distillation, you can, and steam distillation is often used. Essential oils have been used medicinally in history. Um, and some examples, there's a lot of fun um, and uh, examples of essential oils, and we're going to look at just um, something like uh, lavender is one of the most powerful essential oils as far, and it's one of the most enjoyable, except for my best friend doesn't like the smell of lavender, but more for the rest of you, I suppose. <laughs> but it can be used for things like uh, burns. It's very good for also um, keeping a, a wound cleaned after, so it has anti-bacterial um, type properties. It's good for, of course, calming your nerves or relaxation for sleep. Um, it's great for also opening up the tear ducts. So you can put some over your nose and help with that. It's good for dried and chapped skin. Um, we mentioned burns for uh, a skin sunburn. You can add that to your St. John's wort uh, oil and also your comfrey, which has healing medicinal values, to make that into your salve, which we'll do if we had time. And that will uh, help to heal the skin very quickly and effectively. Um, things like lemon, it's great for using in cleaning. Um, you can put even some uh, lemon drops. One of my the favorite words that I heard, but I haven't used it yet, is putting some lemon um, on cotton balls and putting those in your vacuum cleaner and putting it in the vacuum cleaner bag so that it will smell good when you vacuum and not smell bad. I like that idea. Um, lemon has other powerful properties as well. Um, you can use it to cleanse the air. You put some lemon in a spritzer bottle with mostly water you and you can shake it up before you use it every time because of course they're not going to mix but um, you don't have to worry about that so much going bad the essential oil won't mold inside when you mix it with the water but that is a great air freshener you can use whatever essential oils that you like and it can help to cleanse and purify the air um, and give a good smell at the same time okay but you can look up um, online and find 101 uses of different essential oils. Um, but in the Bible, did you know that God likes and uses essential oils as well? This says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, um, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments, what? 
smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory places whereby they have made thee glad. So, you know, we think that we have harnessed these things, we've learned how to distill them and use them, but I think God has sourced and he's just sharing them with us, and so we're getting to use them. So they can also remind us of, I don't know if you've ever, um, if your father or someone you love uh, has a certain smell to them, and you know, when, when you miss them, you go and you take their shirt and you smell it. Well, I think that God has a certain smell to him too. And all of his garments smell of myrrh and aloe and cassia. Maybe that can just, in some way, make him seem even more of that fatherly figure to you. You can draw closer to him in some practical way. These are some simple things for kids in using essential oils. Things like ringworm, tea tree oil, spearmint, peppermint, rosemary. Um, in a carrier oil, that's what, um, these are good for a head lice. You can use thyme, lavender, geranium, um, and apply it to the scalp. It's good for blisters, things like tea tree oil, um, and also bruises and scra scrapes. It's lavender, sunburns, sprains, poison oak, ivy, or poison ivy, insect repellent. And that's a really practical one. Using uh, for insect repellent, you can use peppermint, tea tree oil, citronella, almost any um, essential oil is a good, peppermint straight, if that's all you have, is a good one. Um, but there are other practical, um, uh, there's lots of recipes online for insect repellents using essential oils. Um, when you're traveling, there's a recipe for four thieves and um, this is a story of, I don't know if I have time to get into the story, it's lunchtime already, but Four Thieves, it's a really cute story in a, in a way. Um, these, right around the time of the Black Plague, maybe it's not so cute, it's actually kind of sad. There were these guys that would go around and raid the, um, the homes of those who were sick with the plague, but they weren't getting sick themselves. And um, when the authorities finally caught up with them, they said, we'll make your punishment less if you will share with us your secret. And that's how the story goes, at least. And the story is that they were using this mix of essential oils, and it helped them. So it's a very, uh, essential oils are very beneficial in um, just being, you know, antiseptic and anti, it's killing the bacteria and those sorts of things. So, and you can buy that, you can even make it, I don't have it right there, do I? I know it's, you can find the different essential oils that are in the Four Thieves, but you can buy that. So it's good for you, it's not just for me. Come again? So it is good for you, but one yeah. time it's good for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. For um, immune booster, oregano. Um, I've been using oregano, and you know I am sniffling now, but I went through like all of the winter without getting a, a sniffle. I, I got this because of, I know why I got this, you know, sometimes you know. <laughs> well, but all the winter people were, you know, getting sick around me and I was using essential oils of oregano on my feet and I think that had something to do with how long I said, I wonder why I haven't gotten sick yet. And I think part of it was, well, definitely God was helping me because I, um, he was using me to help somebody else at the time and if I had been sick I wouldn't be able to help them as well. So he was giving me grace not to get sick, but I think by using oregano it helped me this winter not to get sick on the bottom of my feet. And I was doing that for a different reason, but I think it had that side effect good as well. Mm -hmm. The essential oil of oregano, and you can mix it. Um, oregano is very strong. A lot of these can give you blisters, so you want to be careful with essential oils because they're so concentrated um, that you want to mix them with a carrier oil. That's what the um, what those initials, E-G-C-O, the website where I found these ones from, oh, is E-G and then the C-O stands for carrier oil. So you want to mix it with a carrier oil to dilute it so it won't be so strong and give you blisters. Does that help you if you eat it? If you eat it? <laughs> yes, eating oregano, definitely. Let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food, right? Definitely. Um, and that brings me to the point of um, dandelion and chickweed, these two herbs that we've used today, are edible, right? You've maybe heard that before. And so I wanted to provide, and in a salad bar today, you should be getting some chickweed to taste it, to try it, to see, um, because it's all about experimenting, right? Okay, this is um, a recipe for 
um, insect repellent, and that should be in your handout. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yes. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. That was, here's um, a recipe for poultices, and this one may be in your handout as well. Okay? Um, whew. Last year, I did this, lesson, this lecture in, in two different segments and two different hours, and so we just finished the first hour. Yay, we did it in one hour. But there's a whole bunch more that you'll find, and it's all written in your, hand, in your handout. And we'll just quickly um, look through it. This is herbs in your backyard. And this is where it gets really practical, is going out and finding it. Getting yourself a good herb book that has nice big pictures, and um, a friend who maybe knows some things about herbs, and going on a walk. And being sure, though, that there's lots of herbs that look really similar to other herbs, so make sure that you're sure before you eat anything or try anything. Is there a book you recommend? Hmm? Is there a book you recommend? There, I like to use more than one book. Whatever books that you get, I would get at least two or three different books and compare them amongst themselves. Um, there's good books that are for um, plant identification. Then there's books that are really good for telling you what the, good, the herbs are good for once you have identified them. Um, one that's nice is Peterson's Field Guide. And they have um, books for wild edibles, they have books for herbs, and they have them to the region, so wherever you live. Um, so we are going to just look. You'll see um, we focus, there's comfrey. We're going to just quickly um, highlight comfrey because we used it today, and I don't like to use something without sharing specifically what it's good for. Um, Comfrey contains an al alanatoin, a cell proliferant that promotes the healing of damaged tissues. It's recommended for injuries to bones and tissues and sprains, sore bru bruises, br burns, carpal tunnel syndrome, dandruff, hem hemorrhoids, vaginitis, and wounds. And um, it's excellent used externally for those properties. There's a controversy about whether or not it should be used internally. Um, and I'll let you look into the controversy yourself if you're interested. Uh, I have friends who drink it and friends who don't drink it, so it's just make your own choice as you study. Um, again, this is just like a, a brief, what's your appetite? Chickweed was the other one that we looked at. Um, and they, <laughs> I nicknamed it Free Range Health because it's named chickweed because the chickens like to peck at it and eat it, but the North American Chippewa and Iroquois Indians use chickweed for eye washes, for wound poultices. It's an excellent source of vitamins A, D, B, and complexes, and C, rutin, iron, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, zinc, manganese, sodium, copper, and silica. Does anybody want to eat some chickweed for lunch? Yes? <laughs> Say, count me in. But it's great for soothing and irritating skin, cuts, minors, uh, burns, and eczema, as well as rashes and coughs and lung, uh, and it softens the, the tissue complaints, it's lung and soft tissue complaints. And it's interesting, if you look at it, it's a very, um, a very, like, moist herb, when you crush it, it's very soft, very soothing. I don't know if that's, but it's, some herbs are very dry, and some are more moist. And this one is one of those more, like, when you crush it, you'll get a, you'll get a lot of water out of it. Um, and so when you see that, it can help you to think of, like, how it's soothing to the irritating skin and to cuts. You can just crush that when you get a cut and put it on there and help. Um, Things also like plantain that we'll look at, yarrow, those are, um, you have all these notes in your handout, but it's great for wounds externally, um, and you can make wonderful oils out of it. Dandelion, the entire dandelion plant is edible, we know that, like with the roots, from, from the roots all the way to the flowering heads. I don't know about the seeds, I think those. Sounds like you'd you know, eat a big puff ball, right? That would be kind of interesting. I think you could. I don't think it would hurt you, but I don't know how tasty it would be. Garlic, um, wonderful for colds and flus, of course. Um, buried gold. You know, something with garlic. Just I can't um, go into all the details right now, but I just love to bring out the spiritual lessons that I've learned, because you can learn about the other things from books and stuff, but the spiritual lessons that I personally have learned, maybe you won't be able to get from a book. So with the garlic, one of the things with garlic is that 
to get the medicinal value out of it, you have to crush it, right? And in the Bible, there is something else that was crushed for us, and that was Jesus. He was bruised for our iniquities. Um, and we can look at this by the bruising of the garlic, it releases um, the allicin uh, and it activates it. And that um, allows it to be, if you just cook it without allowing it to be bruised and sit, then you can actually um, make it so that you don't get all of the, the good properties out of it. But when you bruise it, you let it sit, and then you steep it, then the allicin becomes activated. Um, and so, through a lot of these herbs, through the comfrey, you'll see when we put it into our um, oil, we, we crushed it, we wilted it. And also that can remind us of, for, for our sakes, um, our sins crushed, Christ crushed uh, him so that we could be healed, so that we could have access to eternal life. So let's thank God for what he has given to us. Um, he's extended us the, the leaves, of the tree of life um, because of his son. And uh, also we're reminded that these, the herbs around us are to remind us also of the leaves of the tree of life that are like hanging over the wall of heaven down into earth. So every time we, we see things in nature, let us turn our minds to the things of heaven. And let's thank him for those things now. Shall we bow our heads and pray? May I ask you? Yes, please do. Are we concerned about pesticides from these Yes, very much so. And you're concerned about, um, where, so you always look at where you're gathering them. If you're gathering them next to a roadside, you're going to be getting exhaust and dust and everything from the road. If you're gathering them in your backyard and you have Toto in your backyard, you're going to have something else on them too. So you want to make sure that you have a clean and good environment where you're getting them. Um, the best place is nice, uh, maybe national forest, but they are, you can't pick off of those, right? But um, having a nice field where they don't spray and things like that. And so, yes, it's definitely a concern. Um, so live out in the country. There's your next <laughs> little plug for that, where you don't have that. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that you have provided everything that we do need. And Father, we want to understand better how to use these things. Thank you for the time that you have given to me to share some of what you've been teaching me. And I know I have a lot to learn, but it's such a joy that there are others who want to learn too. So please, God, help us in our studies always to see the plan of salvation through the things that we are learning so that they can uh, not just prolong our life here on earth, but help us to have eternal life, which is the most important. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.